one of ancient Egypt's most renowned royal women, but is almost unknown by non-Egyptologists. She was known as one of the most beautiful and intelligent queens in the ancient world. Her husband built a temple for her. She may have even been the power behind the pharaoh. Her name was Nefertari, the beauty of the beauties. But who was this mysterious woman? We don't know much about her, but through years of research and putting together various sources of information, we can now possibly tell a more complete story of her life. Nefertari lived during the early 19th dynasty. She was married to Ramses II. When Akhenaten, the heretic king, died, he's the one who favored one god above all others. This was extremely strange for ancient Egyptians. When he died, his son, Tutankhamun, became the next king, and he reinstated all of the gods, as we know from the Restoration Stila. I have restored what was in ruins. As monuments of an eternal age, I have dispelled injustice throughout the two lands. After the untimely death of Tutankhamun, his vizier, I became Pharaoh. I, who had been married before, and who was the possible father of Nefertiti and Mut Nojmet, furthermore the possible father of Horemheb. I, who is the supposed brother of Queen T, grandmother of Tutankhamun, was married to another woman named Tai. Their son was called Nakmi. I and T's brother would then be Aini, as mentioned on their parents' coffins. I married Tut's sister, Ankis Naman, and became Pharaoh. However, the old and ailing man died almost two years later. Ankis and Amun disappeared or died. Horam Hep became the rightful pharaoh. Horam Hep married his sister Mut Nojmet and had a statue made showing the sibling couple at his coronation. Horam Hep had another wife known as Amenia. However, both wives could not bear him children. The end of the 18th dynasty is nothing more than a mess. With Tut having no children and Horam Hep having no children, the family lines were nearing the end. You may be asking why are we having this short recap? But the family line of I may come back later on in this documentary. As for now, we focus on who became the pharaoh after Horemheb. Ramses I was of non-royal birth and was born in the former Hyksos capital region of Avaris, on the border of Sinai and Israel. His uncle married a priestess of Amun, and using the rank of priestess of Amun through the family connections, became friends with Horemheb. Having served in the army with Ramses I, Oram had promoted Ramses to High Priest of Amun, and even later on, to the title of vizier. Ramses I was old, however at the time, he had a son, Sethi, and a grandson, Ramses II. Oram had could see a strong line of successors within the Ramesside family. He announced that Ramses I, would be the next pharaoh by making him co-regent. This move was to end the 18th dynasty and start a new lineage.
When Ramses I died, his son, Seti, became Pharaoh. Seti's son, Ramses, would have been around 10 years old at the time. Nefertari would be around a similar age, and, in only a few short years, she would meet her future husband. The 19th dynasty paid particular attention to women, and, producing many heirs to the throne. Seti's wife, for example, was Mut Toy. She was held in very high esteem, even into the reign of her son, Ramses II. Mut Toy and Seti had two definite children, Ramses and Thea. There is a mention of a second sister to Ramses, known as Penla Mitra. She is shown behind the statue of Mut Toy. Although Ramses married Henna Mitra, she was not his first wife. Seti, a Mutoy, married before he became Pharaoh. And this trend would follow on to Ramses and Nefitari. In ancient Egypt, it was not uncommon for kings to have harems of women. But by the age of 12, Ramses was appointed co-regent with Seti, accompanying him into several battles. Ramses was given a harem on behalf of his father, Seti, as a gift for becoming co-regent. Some Egyptologists believe that Ramses and Nefertari met in this harem. Nefertari was an incredibly interesting person. She was not born of royal blood, but actually came from the household of one of the nobles in probably in Thebes, which is in southern Egypt. Now, Ramsey's family is from the Delta, which is in the north. So this would kind of strengthen political bonds between the north and the south. And Nefertari, when she married Ramses, when she came to the royal court, she was actually given as a gift. Um, a gift of royal marriage to the king. Now, if this weren't strange enough, Seti, Pharaoh Seti, the father of Prince Ramses, did not just give Nefertari to Prince Ramses. He gave a number of wives uh, to Prince Ramses around about the same time. Actually, I, I think they're at the same time, along with um, a parcel of land uh, and uh, a couple of places for the women to live that was comparable to the palace. In this really unusual situation, we have uh, a group of women who are all in our modern parlance, sister wives, moving in. Then I imagine it would have been really interesting because Ramses is a teenager, Nefertari and the other women probably around the same age. Then Nefertari becomes pregnant and actually has the first male heir, which is an important event if you're looking to secure the lineage of the kingship. Nefertari becomes great royal wife. We don't know if this is just because she had the first male heir um, or because of the many other really interesting and fascinating facets of her personality. Although due to little evidence, Egyptologists are divided on how they actually met. Nefertari will remain throughout the reign of Ramses II, his most favorite wife, the apple of his eye, you might say, despite the fact that Ramses had over eight known wives and many, many more, as he was the father of a hundred children, boys and girls. As his father and his mother had met and married before becoming royal, it is probably that Ramses and Nefitari met under similar circumstances. We know that Ramses and Nefitari met at the age of 14 and were married at 16, well before Ramses became Pharaoh. We do not know who Nefitari's parents were, yet she was described as a noble woman. I doubt that the daughter of a noble family would have been placed into a harem. They probably had a chance encounter where they met and became extremely 
in love. Nefertari was indeed a very well-educated woman who could read and write several languages and it would not have taken her two years to have agreed to the marriage if she was arranged from the harem. Nefertari came from a noble background and this would have been quite beneficial to the Ramasad family as they were not noble in that sense themselves. Although some experts are divided on this opinion that she was arranged, some, like myself, can interpret a deep, intense love between the teenage Ramses and Nefertari. Ramses, after all, could have had whichever woman that he chose from his harem, or whichever woman that he wanted at all. So, I think it was quite a special choice that he made with Nefertari. If you look at Nefertari's tomb, we will see just how much uh, Ramses the Great worshipped her as a woman and mother and a partner and through them as a couple we can see that not every marriage was based on matching for politics and for power. She was truly and genuinely loved by her husband. One of the many titles he gave her was The One for Whom the Sun Shines. How lovely is that? And he had built in her honour, at Abu Simbel, a temple. And unusual for those times, her statues are equal in size to his. But yet it took him two years after meeting Nefitari to finally make the move. A few years later, did Ramses, through his love and respect, elevate Nefertari to the status of a goddess? Once they were married, Ramses' mother had taken personal care of coaching Nefertari into being the ultimate queen. We know of the close relationship between Nefertari and Mutoi from a procession at Arbidos, showing Seti, Mutoi, with Ramses and Nefertari behind. It is likely that Mutoi would have enforced the idea to Nefertari of continuing the family line to not end up in disaster like the 18th dynasty. As this became one of Nefertari and Ramses' biggest ambitions. At the great temple of Abu Simba, Ramses showed the two most important women by his side, his great royal wife, Nefitari, and on the other side, his mother. Nefertari bore Ramses six children, although there is the possibility of three more. The six that we know of, bear with while I try and remember the names, Amun Herkepeshef, Pawa Were when an F, Mary Atum, Mary Ra, Merit Amun, and Hemutawe. The other three princesses that we possibly think of from Nefertari are Nebetawe, Baketmut, and sharing the same name as her mother, Nefertari. Probably one of the largest, if not the largest, royal family in ancient Egyptian history. Ramses is prolific. Uh, he has approximately 100 children. So, these children of Nefertari's have 90 plus step siblings. Uh, another really interesting facet of, of Nefertari's home life and kind of the dynamics of her family is that one of the original wives who came into the royal palace when Ramses was a prince before he had ascended to the throne, Aset Nofret. And Aset Nofret also bears many children to Ramses the Great. Uh, she actually has his second male heir. And she goes on to live um, for essentially Nefertari's whole life. Now we never see this in images, we always see just Nefertari depicted as she served that vital semi-divine role. 
Nefertari is one of the greatest queens of ancient Egypt, known for her ravishing beauty, beloved wife of the great pharaoh Ramesses II, and a god's wife of Amun. She eventually ascended into divinity and was worshipped as a god herself. Ramses, king of several wives, who bore him around 100 children. Yet his chief wife was Nefitari. She was given many titles, including the great royal wife. We can deduce the fact that it was indeed Nefitari who was giving the final say on which women Ramses could take as his wife. An inscription about her position translates as rich in affection, fair of face, chief of the harem of the god king, master of the palace. She need only speak, and her wish is fulfilled, mistress of the two lands, Nefertari. This inscription suggests, outright, that she was in charge of choosing the other consorts for her husband. As her full name suggests, Nefertari Merimut, the Merimut part of the name literally translates as the one who has pleased the mother goddess Mut. God's wife. This title was held in high regard and equivalent to that of a high priest within the temple hierarchy. The responsibilities that Nefertari took charge in were strict and divinely important. To be a god's wife of, say, Amun or Ra was to be a consort of that deity. Some of her duties were not only of the religious type, such as the procession of priests for the daily liturgies of Amun, entering exclusive parts of the temple which only the purest of bodies could enter, or even offering food, dinner, lunch, and breakfast to that deity. A practice revived 200 years after Pharaoh Hatshepsut. By marrying a god's wife, it would elevate his own position and thus make him a god himself. The white dress and the golden vulture headdress are the distinctive garbs of a god's wife of Amun. It also shows them offering gifts to the gods with wine, incense, oils, fruits and grains, which were conducted by the pharaohs or the god's wife. Before any rituals, they would conduct a purification ceremony with water so that they were cleansed beforehand. This is depicted by the pictures shown in Tomb TT49 in the Theban necropolis of Egypt. Mut was the wife of the god army. Therefore, by Nefitari sharing the title with Mut, she was instantly connected with the chief god and his wife, and furthermore, making Ramses as armor himself. The couple were the earthly embodiment of Amin and Mut. Nefertari is also only ever shown wearing the vulture crown. The vulture crown was connected to the goddess Mut. We also know that Nefertari was only ever depicted wearing very fine transparent linen. This finery was only reserved for the most important woman in Egypt and Ramses' other wives were not given access to wear this finery, only Nefertari. God's wife was the highest rank of a priestess. Nefutari was awarded this title and would perform daily rituals at Karnak Temple dedicated to the god Amun. Once a year, the festival of Opet would be held to join the two temples and the two gods, Amun and his wife, Mut. This procession would have been led by the earthly embodiment of Amun and Mut, Ramses and Nefitari. It is at Luxor Temple that we can find some of the best wall inscriptions of Nefitari and some exquisite statues of the pharaoh with his wife supporting her husband symbolically. Shown at his knee, 
Even on these statues, we get the idea of the beauty of Nefertari, as well as an idea of her fine linen dresses that delicately reveal the regal woman's soft curves. So far, it is clear how important this queen was toward her husband. But soon into Ramses' reign, when he began campaigns against the Hittites, would this queen be put to the ultimate test? She would have to use her intellect to become the ultimate civil politician and maybe even co-regent. Seti I had trained Ramses extensively on the importance of strong military powers. He accompanied his father into Lebanon, Libya, Nubia, and the Assyrian Hittite region. Stirring up much resentment to come back during the reign of Seti's son. Ramses trained his sons and led them into several battles, including Canaan, Palestine, and several islands like Cyprus. Ramses even ventured as far as Sardinia, where he captured the population known as the Serdan. The Serdan would come in helpful in Ramses' biggest battle ever at Kadesh. We do not know for certain, but it seems Greece and Egypt were allies. In 18th dynasty tombs, we can see Greeks arriving in Egypt with gifts. It appears that they had a good relationship, as every other Mediterranean country caused war with Egypt, apart from Greece. Even Nefitari received several gifts from the queens of Greece, such as her round silver button earrings, a typical royal jewellery item at the time in Greece. A gift that impressed Nefitari so much, she is shown in her tomb wearing them, along with several statues throughout the land. She may have handed them down to her first daughter, Merit Amen, as she is seen wearing the same earrings on her statues. War was upon Egypt. Ramses went into Asia Minor to go and conquer cities, on his way north to the Hittite stronghold of Kadesh. Ramses' vizier at the time, Passer, was not promoted to the overseer, basically, of Egypt at that time. It was Nefertari. One could say that Nefertari was even co-regent while Ramses was away. She was running the country on his behalf. So we get the idea that she might have been co-regent as this is evident in her temple at Abu Simbel where we see in the inner sanctuary Nefertari and Ramses on the throne of Egypt as equals. However, by Ramses being away, Nefertari's life became ever more in danger. Brief papyrus documents mention a scary situation where several Hittite soldiers secretly arrived in Thebes on the West Bank at the Ramesseum construction. An attempt to kidnap Nefitari was made. During the Battle of Kadesh, uh, or while the Battle of Kadesh was taking place, uh, some of the Hittites managed to sneak to the royal palace and the queen was rescued and was not abducted by the Hittites. Luckily, one of her ladies-in-waiting was able to alert the guards in time. This event would have infuriated Ramses upon his return. The Battle of Kadesh had been fought. Ramses records his victory throughout the land on almost every temple wall. Some experts say it was more of propaganda than an actual trial. Yet the Hittites' documents say that they won. And the Egyptians say that they were the winners. Who actually won? We may never know. 
although I am more likely to believe the Egyptian side of the story. There is a cuneiform letter from the Hittite queen to Nefertari and Ramses where she refers to herself and the king as your servant. Now, if the Hittites had truly won the Battle of Kadesh, why would the Hittite queen refer to herself as lower than the Egyptians by referring to herself as a servant? So we can start to get an idea of how the politics was working out at that time. Nefertari knew what needed to be done. Egypt needed resolution and the insurance that Egypt would not again have such a big war. Nefertari actively participated in the egyptian Edith peace treaty that ended the best known conflict of the Ramesside period. We have one letter that survives in a cuneiform tablet and was found in modern day Turkey. This letter is composed of a few lines and addresses the Queen of the Hittites. She was a true partner to Pharaoh Ramesses, using her skills and charm to build a strong diplomatic relationship with another powerful and influential woman. She's one of the only queens of Pharaonic Egypt who engaged in a diplomatic correspondence. Through her diplomacy, she wrote several letters to the Hittite Queen Pudahippa. Some of these letters remain, and they show great affection from Nefitari to the Hittites. She often even refers to herself as your sister. Whether she actually was the sister of Pudahippa, or if this was an affectionate gesture, Nefitari managed to charm the king and queen. She suggested peace between the two empires, a request that was greatly welcomed by both sides. The peace treaty is recorded at Karnak Temple, as well as on a Hittite silver palette, on several stele and tablets. The treaty meant either party would assist to protect their best interests. The entire nation of Egypt admired Nefitari for this. The result of her political efforts was a peace treaty. To demonstrate the importance of that peace treaty, a replica of it is on permanent display in the UN building in New York. Another offer was suggested by Nefitari that the Hittite king was to send the princess for Ramses to marry. This marriage would ensure peace through family bonds. The letters were sent in person by Kemweset, the son of Ramses, to the Hittites. The idea pleased the Hittites, and they sent back a princess for Ramses to take as his wife. Not only a pretty face, Nefitari probably saved Egypt from any further decline. The great queen, Nefertari of the land of Egypt, speaks thus. To my sister, Pudahepa, the great queen of the Hittite land, I, your sister, also be well. May your country be well. that you, my sister, have written to me asking after my health. You have written to me because of the good friendship and brotherly relationship between our brother and the king of Egypt. The Egyptian sun god and the Hittite storm god will bring about peace and he will make the brotherly relationship between the great kings last forever. I have sent you a gift in order to greet you, my sister, for your neck a necklace of pure gold, composed of 12 bands and weighing 88 shekels, blue-coloured linen for one royal dress for the king, and a total of 12 linen garments. 
After her attempted abduction, Ramses took Nefitari on at least two campaigns, where she was protected by her own set of bodyguards. At her temple, she is shown standing next to Ramses as he is in battle. Shortly after these two battles, Ramses took a step back. He would be dedicated to more religious roles at Karnak. His sons, who were well trained by their father, would now become the military force. Ramses set out to make himself into a living god. He commissioned two temples at Abu Simba on the border with Nubia. One temple would proclaim Ramses as a real living god. The other would be dedicated to the love of his life. On the northern or smaller temple of Nofertari at Abu Simbel. There, if you go inside and read the inscriptions on the ceiling, you find that it is she who created this beautiful house or temple in the Pure Mountain. And it is there that the cultic role of Nofertari is actually articulated because among her epithets are, she is the one for whose sake the sun rises. That means she is the embodiment of the female principle who acts as the trigger in order to um, activate the regenerative powers of her husband, Ramses II, so that he can appear each day as the radiant sun shining his bounty upon the prosperity and health of ancient Egypt. Many scenes in both temples show the couple performing several religious rites. We can see many scenes dedicated to the goddess of love, Hathor. Ramses and Nefertari's story and relationship are shown throughout the temple, from Nefertari and Ramses as young teenagers, with Nefertari with exceptionally long hair, all the way to Nefertari being crowned as great royal wife by the two goddesses of Upper and Lower Egypt. At the inner sanctuary of Nefitari's temple, she is shown at the very center, the most important person in this temple. Inside Nefitari's temple, which is the most beautiful temple that I will symbolize in my opinion, we have the innermost sanctuary where we have a little bird flying in with its babies, cute. <laughs> That's, that's love right there. But love here is, about, is abundant. It's Hathor, the cow goddess, and she is here with Nefertari in front of her. And on the side, not in a statue, in a carving, is Ramses II worshipping Hathor and his wife, Nefertari. Now, Ramses is shown here very clearly worshipping his wife. No other king worshipped his wife. No other queen had a whole temple dedicated to herself from the king. She was shown on the same scale as Ramses on the carving and on statues from this point on. On one wall, we even see the royal couple in a moment before a passionate kiss. Nefitari shown as the goddess Moot and Ramses shown as Amun. For me, she epitomizes the perfect woman. Why? Because she was highly intelligent, powerful, loyal, loving and beautiful. And because she was recognised as a true equal to her husband. Today, many women are still striving for equality over 3,000 years later. The temples were to make Ramses into a god and in effect of elevating his own wife he would give her the status of a goddess. The temples were inaugurated in year 24 of Ramses' reign, but the entire temple complex would not have been fully inaugurated until year 36. The inauguration, the initial inauguration, was rushed ahead of time. By this time, Nefertari's health had began to decline. 
We know this from the inside of her temple side chapels. However, a very sad account exists on a stela from the Viceroy, Hekanakt. The stela is actually on the side of Abu Simbel, and what it shows is the initial inauguration taking place, with on the upper side, Ramses and Merit Amun presenting before the gods inaugurating the temple. However, in a lower side of the stela, we see Nefertari on a platform and on a throne that is usually reserved for a barge. The placement of Nefertari on this section of the stela has a very striking meaning. By this time, Nefertari had died. Ramses rushed the inauguration of the temple as a last sign of respect for his wife, where she would be able to see the temple. Being too ill, she did not get off the boat, but she did see the facades. Upon her journey back, she passed into the next world. Nefitari was 30 years old, the lady for whom the sun shines, but now gone from the land of Egypt. The death of Nefertari must have been extremely devastating for Ramses. We get the sense in his later inscriptions that he must have gone into a form of depression. He lived into his 90s and outlived many of his family members. Although he had other wives, it appears that no one could replace Nefertari. Before her untimely death, Ramses began to prepare an extravagant tomb for Nefitari. No expense was spared in the creation of her tomb. Even the artists who crafted the tomb must have been in love with the queen, as the art does not only show religious rites, but it exudes love from the people who made it. In the tomb, Ramses left a poem dedicated to Nefitari, and listening to it, the words convey his true feelings of love and sadness, now that she was no longer by his side. My love is unique. No one can rival her. For she is the most beautiful woman alive. Just by passing, she has stolen away my heart. She who fills the colonnaded halls with her perfume is the land of Bont. Her perfect breast is red in the finest of white linens. Slender neck. Gold is nothing compared to her arms. Her fingers are like lotus petals. Her waist is narrow. Brown buttocks. Skin as fair and soft as magic. Her hair is color of the darkest lapis. Beautiful face. My love for her is unique. No one can rival her. She is the most beautiful woman in the world, beloved of Moot, Nefertari, the beauty of the beauties. Nefertari's tomb was discovered in 1904 by Italian Egyptologist Caparelli. It is regarded one of the most beautiful tombs in the whole of Egypt and is truly mesmerizing and a testament to Ramesses' love for his beautiful wife. 
He referred to her as the one for whom the sun shines. Years after the death of Ramses, Egypt went into a decline. And tomb robbing was right. We know that the tomb of Nefitari was not robbed by Egyptians, as the priests had moved all of the bodies from the Valley of the Queens into one hidden tomb. That of Prince Kemweset, son of Ramses III. Nefitari's body was not moved. Her tomb was later plundered by a new group who had come to Egypt 1500 years after Nefitari was laid to rest. The Coptic Christians, tombs that were not robbed by ancient Egyptians, were then plundered by the Christians and even used as hideaways. Nefitari's worldly goods were stolen, her granite sarcophagus was smashed to pieces, her mummified body ripped apart and burned as firewood. Only two parts of her body remain. The parts of her legs, as discovered by Italian explorer Ernesto Scapi Relli in 1904. In the tombs, the mummified human remains were discovered. These were in three fragmented pieces, all belonging to the legs. So one piece appeared to be part of a femur, a patella, a tibia, the other part of a femur, and the third part of a tibia. Now the question was, do these mummified remains belong to Queen Nefertari? So over a century later, in 2016, a team of international researchers put this to the test with some fascinating results. They found that the mummified remains did indeed belong to a female. She was significantly taller than the average Egyptian woman, slender, and probably died between the ages of 40 to 60, which does correspond with the age that we think Nefertari was when she died. We know she was probably in her late 40s, perhaps even early 50s. But what caused the Queen's death? In 2019, new evidence may have been uncovered. Her mummified legs were sent under a CT scan to see a possible cause. Many experts suggested heart disease. Some others have suggested malaria. Ramses adored her. He called her the one for whom the sun shines. She's here in Kansas City on loan from the Italian Museo Egizio in Turin for an exhibition at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And we're going to look at life in Egypt. It's not about death. It's about how people lived 3,000 years ago. These scans. This is the volume rendered and reconstruction of the legs. Will be analyzed by cardiologist and internationally recognized mummy research expert, Dr. Randall Thompson. His team will try to determine whether or not Nefertari suffered from heart disease thousands of centuries ago. One of the main things we're looking for is whether there's any arterial disease in the leg. Uh, it's amazing that if there's calcium in the arteries, uh, it lays down and 3,000 years later, you can still see it with the CT scanning. What's also interesting is that the embalming material was chemically analyzed using gas chromatography and the chemicals that had been used during the mummification process were consistent with those used during the New Kingdom period. But can we tell how she died? This is very difficult, but the x-rays did reveal cortical thinning and some porosity, which is a sign of osteoporosis which is a disease in which the bones become so fragile that they can easily fracture. Another significant find of the x-rays was arterial calcification, which is an indicator of arterial disease. So to look at this in more detail, the latter part of 2019, she was CT scanned in St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City. And cardiologist Dr. Thompson's initial thoughts were, there does indeed appear to be arterial calcification. So perhaps she was suffering from atherosclerosis, which is a very serious condition that can ultimately lead to a heart attack or a stroke and even death. The few remaining artifacts from her tomb include an alabaster and gold perfume jar, an ivory container used for face creams, topped with a finely carved goose with some of the content still inside. A 
analysis shows her face cream contained frankincense, almond, cedar and argin oil extracts. An exquisite gold and red jasper stone ring with her cartouche. Several shatis, alabaster jars, linen, broken wooden boxes, a pair of sandals and most interestingly, a tip of a walking stick with the cartouche, a pharaoh eye. Why would an item belonging to the 18th dynasty pharaoh, I, be present in Nefertari's tomb? We found in the tomb of Nefertari the name of I, and that's why people started relating, that's why archaeologists and Egyptologists started relating uh, I or Nefertari to I, that maybe she is the daughter of I, but that's really, when you look at the time frame between the time of I and the time of Nefertari, this is really hard to believe. He would have been extremely old to have a daughter at that time. And probably, maybe, he is the grandfather, but nothing is solid, nothing is confirmed at all. Some suggest it was placed there by accident during tomb raiding, but that is unlikely. Is it possible that she was buried with an item that belonged to a former pharaoh, an item that she wanted to keep close to her, an item that could even prove Nefitari's true noble heritage. I and his first wife have a son named Nakmeen. He was married to Ui. He is mentioned as Viceroy of Kush during the reign of Tutankhamun and was succeeded by Parsir, the vizier, under Ramses II. Nakmeen was the chosen successor after I, however, he died, leaving his wife and their son also named I. I, son of Nakhtmin, was to become the high priest of Mut, and as we know, Nefitari's full name was ended with the words Mary Mut, a title that would have been handed down due to a family member working as a priest of Mut. The connection between the walking stick fragment, with I's name in her tomb, and the family line of Pharaoh, I, surely all start to point towards the answer. Nefitari is noted as coming from a noble family after all. We already discussed how Nefitari called the Hittite queen, her sister. This may be true, this may also just be a gesture of friendship. However, another family has come up. Indua, a nobleman, from the late reign of Seti and early reign of Ramses, is shown on a statue with a woman. This statue has been identified as a marriage statue. But is it? The man and the woman are shown holding each other by the shoulder. In Egyptian art, a marriage statue would rather be shown holding at the waist. A statue of support or showing family would rather show holding the shoulder. A steely from dear Omdina reports the wife of Pindula as Ter. The woman shown with Pindula is titled as Nefertari. Is it possible that because of Nefertari's high status, her possible brother, Pindula, could have commissioned this statue? Or is this Nefertari's one daughter with a husband, although the timing is out then? Although the likelihood that Nefertari was rather related to A is better. Her images adorned temple walls throughout Egypt. She was shown on the same scale as her husband. She appears alongside Ramses on so many statues. She had her own temple. She was the queen of Egypt. Her tomb is the most exquisite example of Egyptian painting, but it was almost wiped out completely. It was closed for a good many years, about 20 years, and the Getty Foundation went in and spent millions on restoring this tomb. Nefitari's tomb was unfortunately built above a salt flat. Because her tomb was created in a unique style. With wet paint being applied to wet plaster in a more fresco style. The salt was able to grow, forming crystals under the plaster which pushed the paintings off of the walls. 
In 1986, an Italian team stepped in to save Nefitari's tomb. The walls were slowly taken down and the salt was removed. After placing back, any small damaged areas were touched up with fine lines that appear solid from afar. The tomb was opened again to the public in 1994, but after testing, it was closed a few years after in the early 90s. The humidity from tourists could activate the salt to grow again, and conditions need to be controlled to preserve the tomb. Today you can enter the tomb, but not as a general public member, you need a high price ticket, or special access to this sacred site. Ancient Egyptians were still as human as we are today. To think that they were any uh, different to us would be a grave mistake. The societies come and go, human nature changes, yet emotions still stay the same. They loved, they hurt, they aspired to do better, they prayed when times of crisis struck. Nefitari has been made popular in the early 1900s with movies like The Ten Commandments. However, these films are mere fiction, with Nefitari being portrayed as some sort of vixen who double times the pharaoh. This is not true, and these movies should only be seen as simple entertainment and not fact. The movie Ten Commandments, made in 1956, by Cecil B. DeMille depicted Nefertari far from her reality. In the movie, Nefertari had a love affair with Moses. Her character's motive was to do anything to be with him, even if it meant killing a servant who revealed Moses' true slave origins to protect him from the Pharaoh's wrath. In my opinion, she was portrayed as shallow, cunning and love-struck. It may be argued that this is the point at which Nefertari becomes an icon of popular culture. Certainly the character is third in the cast list and is played by an actress at the height of her ability. Anne Baxter had received an Academy Award in 1946 and had been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actress in 1951. With her large eyes and mobile mouth, Anne Baxter resembles in many respects a character from the Archie comics. And yet she is more than just a glamorous actress. She is an actress of considerable ability and nuance. The suggestion is that rather than whomsoever wins the throne of Egypt also gains the hand of Nefertari, it's DeMille's suggestion that it's the other way round. And that's one of the reasons why we have the difficulties between the relationship of Ramesses and Nefertari. She becomes, in many respects, almost Lady Macbeth to his Ramesses II. The character of Nefertari, referred to throughout as Nefertiri, is actually a strange amalgam of the vamp created by Thedabara back in 1917's Cleopatra, but also the sort of noirish, monstrous woman portrayed by Barbara Stanwyck in Double Indemnity. It's, a, it's an interesting mix of characters. It's a very interesting way of perceiving the character and of entering her into a plot where otherwise she would be absent. In this movie, The Mummy Returns, she's even presented as a powerful fighter, which uh, shows her in a completely new way. Connecting the past and the present, Nefertari is of great potential to experience the Egyptian era really up close to ourselves. I hope that we can resurrect the iconic aura of Nefertari together and show to the world the magnificent person she was. Now, Rhythm Dennis was an exotic dancer with an artistic bent, and the story goes that in 1904 she was touring with her group and she saw an advert for the cigarette brand Egyptian Deities, and from then on she became hooked by ancient Egypt and ancient cultures in general. And of course 1904 is also the year that Nefertari's tomb was discovered. So obviously there is that link there too. Now by 1910, Ruth St. Dennis had created a series of dances called Egypta. And you can see, in my opinion, the influences of Nefertari's tomb and Nefertari in general 
through the dancers from the elongated eye shape to the sheer dresses that Ruth and Dennis and her a group of dancers were all wearing. Now I love this because for me it is an example of Nefertari's beauty and grace reaching out across the centuries and because Ruth St. Dennis is credited with creating and defining modern dance I think it's a great example of how Nefertari is still with us and still influencing us today. At some point we need to stop looking at these people as scientific reports in a book. We have to stand back and look at their human emotions. And by doing this, we might be able to see and understand their history in a more personal way. I have visited Nefertari's tomb a couple of times, and each time it is an overwhelming experience. Nefertari truly was the most beautiful woman here in Egypt. For me, I am so overwhelmed to be in here. It's amazing. Something interesting you'll notice is that in her tomb, there's not one depiction of her husband, Ramses II. I like to believe that she is shown on her own here because Ramses loved her so much that he wanted to pay tribute to his great wife by dedicating this tomb, this incredibly magnificent tomb, to Nefertari. Now let me tell you about the real Nefertari. Well educated, she could read and write hieroglyphics. For me Nefertari is a very powerful woman. I am passionate about Nefertari for several reasons. An incredibly interesting person. Ramses the Great worshipped her as a woman. He built a temple to her. The one for whom the sun shines. The Lady of Greece. Nefertari. The most beautiful of them all. Nefertari becomes an icon of popular culture. Nefertari Meriemut, as Hathor forever and ever. Remember that name, Nefertari. Nefertari was quite perfect. A most unbelievable woman that you should know more about. There have been hundreds of queens throughout Egypt's history, but for me, no other compares to the splendor, the grace, the elegance, and the beauty than that of Nefertari.